deformation process in a real crystal structure of a metal. In the linked video, the basics of the deformation of a metal have already been discussed in detail. Let us summarize the most important facts here. The deformation process in a metal is based on the slipping of atomic planes. These atomic planes are then also referred to as slip planes. Sliding occurs when a certain critical resolved shear stress is exceeded in the slip plane and especially in slip direction. Based on the acting bonding forces between the atomic planes, theoretical predictions of these critical shear stresses can be made for a defect-free ideal crystal. In practice, however, it is found that the actual critical shear stresses required for real metals are significantly lower than the theoretical values for the ideal lattice structure. The reason for this deviation lies in certain crystallographic defects which are present in a lattice structure in reality. These are dislocations, of which only the edge dislocation will be considered in more detail in the following. Due to the dislocations, it is no longer necessary to break all the bonds between two planes simultaneously when moving a lattice plane. Instead, it is sufficient to overcome one row of bonds at a time. The dislocation core jumps step by step from atomic row to atomic row with a minimum of force and finally emerges from the material surface as a slip step. Thus, due to the low energy migration of the dislocations, the deformation process starts at much lower critical shear stresses than predicted theoretically without dislocations. This critical shear stress is also called pyarl stress. The low force sliding of an atomic plane by a dislocation can be illustrated by moving a carpet. To displace a large and heavy carpet as a whole, a great force is usually required because of the friction between the carpet and the floor. However, if you make a fold in the carpet and then move the fold, you can displace the carpet much more effortlessly. The carpet moves step by step, like a caterpillar. With the understanding of the atomic mechanism of deformation and the central role of dislocations, measures can now be taken to specifically prevent the deformation of a metal. This is always important when the materials used must not deform even under high loads. Such construction materials must therefore be high strength. Measures to increase the strength of metals are explained in more detail in the following. These include, for example, solid solution strengthening, precipitation hardening, grain refinement, and strain hardening. The principle of solid solution strengthening is based on lattice distortion by foreign atoms. These can be both substitution atoms and interstitially dissolved foreign atoms. These foreign atoms distort the lattice in their immediate vicinity and thus make it difficult for the dislocation to migrate past the foreign atoms. Only at higher stresses can the dislocations move past the lattice distortion caused by the foreign atoms. Deformation of the lattice therefore only occurs at significantly higher critical shear stresses. In this way, an increase in the strength of the material is ultimately achieved. Many alloys are ultimately based on the principle of solid solution strengthening. Pure materials such as copper or nickel are very soft and unsuitable as construction materials. However, when these pure materials are mixed, solid solutions are formed that have a strength-increasing effect. Such copper-nickel alloys are used, for example, in shipbuilding and automotive engineering because of their high strength and good corrosion resistance. Similar to how foreign atoms can interfere with dislocation movement in solid solution strengthening, precipitates can also block dislocation migration. The movement of the dislocations is hindered by the compounds precipitated in the metal, which has a strength-increasing effect. This is known as precipitate strengthening or age hardening. This principle is used for so-called age-hardenable aluminum alloys. An alloy of aluminum, copper and magnesium is often used. This alloy is also called duralumin. Duralumin is first heated to a relatively high temperature immediately before processing so that the foreign atoms it contains can dissolve completely in the aluminum lattice. The solubility decreases with decreasing temperature, so that a high temperature of approximate 500 degrees Celsius is required for complete dissolution. This heat treatment is called solution annealing. After annealing, rapid cooling is performed so that the foreign atoms are forced to remain dissolved in the lattice despite their lower solubility. The rapid cooling is also referred to as quenching. Since in the quenched state the concentration of the foreign atoms contained is above the actual solubility limit, 
this is also referred to as a supersaturated state. In this state, duralumin is relatively soft and can be easily formed. For this reason, duralumin is used, among other things, as a material for rivets. The rivets can therefore be formed well at first in this soft state. However, the supersaturated state is not thermodynamically stable, so that the forcibly dissolved foreign atoms begin to precipitate out of the aluminum lattice and form their own intermetallic compounds within the metal. These compounds are referred to as precipitates. The precipitation process is also referred to as aging. Depending on the material, a noticeable increase in strength can be observed after just a few minutes by aging at room temperature. A rivet made of duralumin reaches its maximum strength after a few days. In order to accelerate this aging process, a precipitation hardenable alloy can also be slightly heated after processing so that the diffusion processes can take place more quickly and the precipitation formation is accelerated. This is then referred to as artificial aging. Conversely, the aging process can be slowed down by cooling the material. For example, rivets for aircraft construction are stored at very low temperatures after quenching in order to extend the processing time. Another commonly used measure to increase strength uses the obstruction of dislocation migration across grain boundaries. When moving dislocations hit grain boundaries, the dislocation is stopped by the distorted lattice structure. Grain boundaries are therefore not a weak point in the material, but a major contributor to its strength. A large number of grain boundaries is achieved by having as many fine grains as possible in the microstructure. Therefore, grain boundary hardening is also called grain refining. The smallest possible grain size with many grain boundaries can be achieved by specifically influencing the melt during solidification. This can be done, for example, by strong undercooling of the melt. This then leads to increased nucleation and the melt solidifies at many spots simultaneously. The result is many grains in the microstructure and thus many grain boundaries. Another possibility for grain refining is the targeted addition of foreign particles immediately before the melt solidifies. This process is also called seeding. The added foreign particles serve as nuclei for as many grains as possible. The principle of grain refinement is applied to the so-called weldable fine grain steels. Carbon in steel has a strength increasing effect, but is undesirable for good weldability. Carbon makes the steel hard and brittle due to rapid cooling after welding. In order to achieve good weldability, as is often required in steel construction in particular, it is therefore necessary to keep the carbon content in the steel as low as possible. In order to nevertheless guarantee high strength, grain refining is required. The diameters of the individual grains in fine-grain structural steels are in the range of a few micrometers. Another way of increasing strength is based on the interaction of the dislocations with each other. Dislocations can interfere with each other due to the resulting lattice distortions. This is particularly the case when two dislocations meet perpendicularly on different slip planes. These dislocations then block each other and cannot move on. In this context, one also speaks of a so-called forest dislocation. If a relatively large number of dislocations are introduced into a material within certain limits, there is a high probability that they will block each other. In this way, a strength-increasing effect is achieved. The introduction of new dislocations into a lattice structure takes place by plastic deformation. In polycrystalline materials, new dislocations are formed in this way, especially at the grain boundaries, which then block each other within the grain. The introduction of dislocations and the associated increase in strength is also referred to as strain hardening or work hardening. The increase in strength with plastic deformation can also be shown clearly using the stress-strain diagram. For this purpose, a tensile specimen is plastically stretched beyond the yield strength. If the force is subsequently removed, the specimen returns to zero stress in a line parallel to the elastic line. The material therefore shows a permanent strain. If the tensile test is now repeated, the specimen again stretches along the elastic straight line and is then, however, only plastically deformed at higher stress values. The comparison of the two curves clearly shows that the plastic deformation now only occurs at higher stress values which means that the strain-hardened specimen obviously has a higher yield strength. 
The tensile strength also increases accordingly. For example, in the production of cold rolled sheet, work hardening is deliberately induced to achieve significantly higher strength than in the hot rolled condition. It should be noted, however, that strain hardening cannot take place to any degree. If too many dislocations are introduced by plastic deformation, the dislocation density increases considerably and the material is destroyed locally in cracks. This behavior can be seen, for example, when a wire is bent back and forth several times. This only works well until too many dislocations are introduced and the wire finally breaks. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.